Father, we praise you that you have sent your Son who, as we saw in uh, Revelation, is the Lamb who stands as if slain. He is alive. We praise you, Father, that we get to applaud your greatness. That passage deserves it. You deserve it. It is, a, it is wonderful news that we have a risen Savior. We worship him today. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, this morning, we uh, are coming to the conclusion of our series in John, which has uh, been covering the upper room discourse or um, Jesus' farewell discourse. And last Sunday actually concluded the discourse itself as we looked at the high priestly prayer. And uh, as we've seen throughout the study, the uh, disciples didn't understand what Jesus was telling them. As he's telling them these things that we hear now and receive such comfort, they didn't quite grasp. They, we even saw kind of a humorous exchange where you know, like a, a little child who says, oh yes, I understand gravity. Some, some idea that a four-year-old maybe qu quite not, can't quite grasp. And yet the disciples, they say, oh yes, Lord, finally you're speaking to us plainly and we understand. And Jesus says, okay, you don't really fully understand, but you will. And as we've hinted at throughout this series, the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit is really the thing that impresses Christ's words upon the disciples' hearts, where it's at that moment they do truly get it. And it's after that that we see true belief really spring up in the hearts of the disciples. And John, uh, in the passage we're gonna cover today, draws um, had a special attention to one of the disciples in particular, Thomas. We all know Thomas as Doubting Thomas. We're gonna look at that story today and I think it should tie, tie not only the discourse together in our minds, but just the entirety of, of John's gospel and the purpose of John writing his gospel. And we talk a lot in this church about faith and John uses the word believe just throughout the book. And our, the study of the passage today, I think we'll really just hone in what we mean when we say faith alone. So look with me at John chapter 20 this morning. John chapter 20. And we're gonna be reading, starting in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and 
put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As we saw last week, uh, when Jesus finished the high priestly prayer, uh, he finished by praying for those who would believe. He finished by praying for us. He had prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, and then he turns and he prays for us. He says, I do not ask for these only. I don't ask for only my disciples, those who are with me now, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This word believe, as I said, is used heavily throughout John's gospel. The uh, gospel of John is you know, frequently handed out as an evangelism tool, right? I've, at least in my circles growing up, had like a little uh, gospel of John tract where it was just in a neat little booklet and you can hand that out. Um, it's oftentimes the book that we recommend to a new believer when they say, okay, now that I believe, where, where do I start? John's a great book to start. And I think the reason it's used like this is because it's the purpose that John wrote it. He wrote it for the purpose of evangelism. You may have even heard John referred to as John the Evangelist. And we saw John's purpose uh, plainly spelled out in verse 31 of chapter 20. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you take that purpose statement, I love it when an author gives a very clear purpose statement. You take that purpose statement and you read through the book of John and that just jumps off the pages as you read through it. Every chapter, it's just jumping off the pages of John that this is why he is writing his gospel. He wants his readers to believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is none other than Jesus. And that life comes through belief or faith in him alone. And when John wrote this, he specifically had in mind the Jewish people who uh, had been dispersed into the Gentile world. And his pur as his purpose statement says, he's answering the question, who is the Messiah? Who is the Christ? And as a disciple of Jesus, an eyewitness to everything that he had done, an eyewitness to the crucifixion, an eyewitness to the resurrection, he is able to give a definitive answer and saying, you are looking for your Messiah. I have seen him. I'm not going to tell you simply what type of Messiah to look for, what traits you might see in the Messiah. I'm going to tell you who the Messiah is. He has come. The good news is that he explains in his letter, and especially as we saw in the farewell discourse, just the riches that are ours who come to him by faith, the blessings that are ours through the Messiah that are just beyond measure. John's readers, though, had several big obstacles to overcome. First, their, expect, their expectation of who the Messiah was was skewed. Uh, they had a picture in their mind of a Messiah who would come and he would be a conquering king and deliver them from their captors. In this case, in their current circumstances, deliver them from Rome. They were looking for a Messiah who would come and restore the kingdom restore the promised land to them. And the disciples clearly had the same picture of the Messiah. 
But when you put Jesus next to the Messiah, next to this picture of, uh, that they had in their minds about the Messiah, Jesus fell short. Like, well, he's doing all these great things, but when is he gonna deliver us from Rome? He doesn't really even talk about that. What's going to happen? Why, how could this man who's doing all these great things be the Messiah if the Messiah is supposed to look like this? Supposed to do this. But there's an even bigger issue at hand concerning Jesus. In their minds, he died. He was crucified. Many of those in John's audience uh, possibly had even made the pilgrimage that year to the Passover and to Jerusalem for the Passover and had been witness to the crucifixion or had at least heard all the hubbub that was going around for Christ being dragged before the high priest and before Herod and Pilate and finally beaten and scourged and crucified. Or they had at least heard the rumors of yet another Messiah, someone claiming to be the Messiah who came only to be killed by the very people that he's supposed to deliver them from. They surely had heard the rumors that the uh, priests had passed along after the resurrection. As they said, tell them the disciples snuck in in the middle of the night and stole the body. All of this is probably heard. So the question is, how could a dead man who died at the hand of those he was supposed to conquer possibly be this promised Christ? This is the question the disciples themselves struggled with between the cross and the resurrection. They thought Jesus was the Messiah, but then he was betrayed. He was mocked, beaten, crucified, put in the tomb. The question, who was the Messiah then, is seen repeatedly in John's gospel. The uh, struggle here, really, we, we sang the song, worthy is the lamb who was slain. That's not the Messiah that they had pictured. The Jesus himself was just a humble man. They expected the conquering king, but as Isaiah 53 says, he came in and didn't look special. There was nothing really unique about him other than all the amazing miracles he was doing, but they wanted something more. They, they thought surely this would be a grand king, a beautiful person who would come in and save the day. But this wasn't who Jesus was, as we see in Philippians 2. The Messiah, the Jesus we know, is the one who stripped himself. He didn't change, but he set aside the rights and the privileges of being God so that he would humble himself by taking on human flesh, taking on the form of a slave and serving his father, obeying his father. So John answers this question a few times, or we see it at least posed a number of times throughout John. We see the priests and the Levites, right at the beginning, they go to John the Baptist, and they ask him, who are you? And the implied question is, are you the Christ? Because John answers, John the Baptist, he says, I am not the Christ. The Samaritan woman at the well says, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. But when he, com- when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Then when Jesus heals the man who was born blind, both the man and his parents are brought before the Pharisees and they're questioned. They ask his parents, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but 
how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, for he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And sure enough, they end up casting out the man who was now formerly blind. And Jesus finds him and he asks him, do you believe in the son of man? That's another messianic title. Do you believe in the son of man? And the, blind, the formerly blind man answered, and who is he? Sir, that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. In chapter 10, the crowd says to Jesus, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, just tell us plainly, okay? Come on, just tell us plainly. If you are the Christ, tell us. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And this leads us into the next point of John's argument. He's saying the Messiah is Jesus. Let me also show you throughout my, my book, the Messiah is the Son of God. I and the Father are one, Christ says here. We read this throughout the Upper Room Discourse. Jesus proclaiming this oneness, this unity with the Father from the very beginning of John's gospel, John argues that Jesus is not just a good teacher, not uh, some sort of demigod or lesser God, but the one true and living God. And John 1.1 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was, with, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him not anything made that was made was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side. He, Jesus, has made him known. Even the authorities, the Jewish authorities understood Jesus was making this claim. In John chapter five, it's recorded, it says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, you know, he's breaking the Sabbath by healing people. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So with John's argument of the book in mind, that the Messiah, the son of God, is none other than Jesus, and life is found in him alone. Let's dive in now to our passage in John 20. So this is obviously after the farewell discourse. Christ has gone to the garden with his disciples. He is betrayed by Judas. He is brought before the high priests the charges of blasphemy are brought against him. They bring him to Pilate, demanding that he is crucified. He is flogged and beaten. As you look at the gospels in harmony, it's, it appears that there's probably two different floggings. One where Pilate's just kind of giving him a flogging that would be for a minor offense. It's kind of trying to satisfy the Jews saying, look, I, I've punished him. I don't really find any guilt in him. 
Now, are you satisfied? But then there, another flogging would have come. And that is the flogging that would have taken place after the death sentence has been handed down. And it's a flogging that uh, not many would have uh, survived. It was usually done for those about to go to crucifixion because, again, you wouldn't survive and it would kind of help speed the crucifixion along. That's the one that we understand would usually involve a couple Roman soldiers and they would have their whips, usually with pieces of bone and glass in the leather straps of the whip and they would beat the person. They would flog him over and over and over again, generally to the point of exhaustion. Not the person being whipped, but their own exhaustion. These two men would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until they were simply exhausted and couldn't carry on anymore. That has taken place. And then Christ is nailed to the cross. And the disciples, as John records, are kind of, at least a couple of them are following along in the background and they're witnessing these, things, these events take place. And then to make sure that Jesus is dead, they pierce his side and the blood and water pour out and he is buried. So John 20, 19. On that evening, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you is a standard greeting, but it, it had to have carried so much more significance at that moment when the risen Christ is standing before them and he says, peace be with you. If you remember the words from the discourse, he had told them, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The disciples had just witnessed all these horrific things that Jesus underwent to the point of being laid in the tomb. And now he stands before them saying, peace be with you. He overcame the world. The world did not overcome him. Verse 20 when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I think the, uh, the translation there, then the disciples were glad when they see the, saw the Lord, seems a little underwhelming. Seems like eh, kind of the understatement of the century. They were glad when they saw the Lord. But the, the, it, the, the word glad there probably carries with it uh, the idea that they rejoiced. They were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They had been locked away for fear of the Jewish authorities, but they rejoiced when they saw the risen Messiah. Verse 24, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. So a week had gone by. Thomas is yet to see Jesus, but he's been with the other disciples uh, who have seen Jesus and they believe, but Thomas can't overcome what he had seen. I saw 
Jesus, beaten to a bloody pulp. I saw him nailed to a cross. I saw his side pierced. I saw the blood and water come out. I saw him removed from the cross, wrapped and laid in a tomb. I won't believe until I see. You cannot overcome the things he had seen, the things he had witnessed. He wanted definitive proof of life before believing in the testimony of the other disciples. He wanted to touch the wounds that only a dead man would have before he would believe. Continuing on. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came again, stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he turns to Thomas. He knew what Thomas wanted. He says, Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus knew the proof that Thomas wanted and he willingly showed it to him. He didn't withhold it. And we'll get to this in a minute, some of the maybe misunderstanding that we have with this passage. He didn't withhold the evidence of his resurrection from Thomas. He willingly offered it up. Thomas, go ahead. Put your finger in my hands. Put your hand in my side. When he says, do not disbelieve, but believe, you can, you can read that. Do not be an unbeliever, but a believer. Jesus is calling Thomas here, who had previously said, unless I do these things, I will not believe. He is calling Thomas to true saving faith in his Messiah. And then Thomas answered Christ. My Lord and my God. The word used here for Lord is kurios. It's uh, translated Lord, Master, Sir. But it's also the word that is uh, used in the Greek Old Testament for God's high name, the Yahweh. And especially in its use here, commentators believe that this is what Thomas is truly saying. When he pairs it with, when he says, my Lord and my God, he is saying, my Yahweh. This is God's high name from the Old Testament, the name that was given to Moses. Lord, who should I tell them that you are? Tell them I am. I am who I am. Yahweh my Yahweh and my God. We give Thomas a lot of grief for doubting, but this is really, this scene right here is the pinnacle of John's entire gospel. He is coming to this point saying that my argument has been that the Messiah, the Son of God, is none other than Jesus Christ. And... Here is an example of that belief in Thomas, who, upon seeing the risen Savior, makes such a clear confession of faith, of who Jesus Christ is, when he says, my Yahweh and my God. Thomas in this moment has gone from being a staunch skeptic to a believer. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Now we've, many of our modern translations have formed this into a sentence, but the the original language reads more like, because you have seen me, 
you have believed. Jesus isn't belittling Thomas's faith. He is simply saying, I affirm your confession, Thomas. Thomas, you have confessed me to be your Lord and your God. I affirm your confession. Then Jesus gives a blessing to those who would believe without the benefit of seeing. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And much like in the high priestly prayer where he prays for his disciples and prays for all who will believe in him through their testimony, again, he's not belittling Thomas's confession of faith, but he knows that many will come to saving faith in him without having the opportunity to see him. In this life, at least. Without seeing him, though, we will confess along with Thomas through faith, my Lord and my God, and we who will have that same, we who have that same confession as, uh, as Thomas had when he saw Christ, although we don't see Christ, we share in that same blessing of eternal life that Thomas had. Too often we read this as uh, Jesus encouraging us to have a blind faith. And faith is Certainly more than believing the truth, but it is not any less than believing the truth. Imagine if a defense attorney stood up in his opening statement and said, men and women of the jury, I'm not going to be presenting you with any witnesses or evidence, for blessed are those who believe without seeing. Right? No. In fact, John's entire argument in his gospel is writing the, his testimony of what Jesus Christ has, who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Listen to John's own, word, own words as he uh, tells about the crucifixion. He gives his own eyewitness account. In John 19, it says, since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. John is speaking about himself here. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. He is testifying to the fact of Jesus' death as an eyewitness. He says, I was there. He's previously placed himself there standing next to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he sees the spear plunge into Jesus' side. He sees the blood and water spill out. The sign of a dead man. They didn't break Jesus' legs because they didn't need to break Jesus' legs. He was already dead. And John is saying, I am an eyewitness to the fact that Jesus died. I'm an eyewitness to the fact that Jesus died. Even in Paul's great argument in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, he says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me.
John wants us to see the testimony of his gospel and see that the Messiah is real, the Son of God is real. He is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. The testimony is true. Yes, you have heard that Jesus died, that he was crucified. I am here to tell you that he rose, that he is no longer dead, he is alive. In John chapter 20, verse 30, he continues, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So then we ask the question, what does it mean to believe? Earlier in John, uh, the people ask him, what works must we do? And he, he models for them Abraham. He says, do the work of Abraham and believe. Abraham believed God's promise and God counted that to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified through his faith. We too are justified through faith. As I said earlier, saving faith is more than simply believing the truth, but it's not less than that. John details over and over the facts being made clear to the Jewish authorities, the miracles being done by Jesus, yet they refused to believe in him. And Judas himself, as we've seen, was with Jesus throughout his ministry. He saw the miracles. He he took part in the grace and love from Jesus. And yet, in the end, he betrayed him. Saving faith is more than just believing a set of truths about Jesus. It's more than recognizing him as a Messiah, the Son of God. As James says, even the demons believe and shudder. Saving faith knows Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who came not as the conqueror over an earthly kingdom, but the conqueror over sin and death. As John the Baptist declares at the very beginning of John's gospel, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A lamb is meant for sacrifice, for a sin sacrifice. The spotless Lamb of God offered up for the sins of the nation. Jesus, he says, early on, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Saving faith sees Jesus as the Messiah, the suffering servant that was required to bring us peace with our creator. And saving faith goes beyond this. It goes to a personal confession of faith. As again, we see Thomas's confession, the pinnacle of John's letter. When he saw the resurrected Christ and he believed, he said, my Lord and my God. Saving faith sees that Jesus came to rescue you and eternal life is only found in him. This is John's entire argument. Now, as the men prepare for communion, we consider the resurrection, it's the vindication of all Christ had come to do. His work of salvation was so completely finished that even the grave could not hold him. So as we saw in Revelation, and as we sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
This is what John wants his readers to confess along with Thomas. Even though we do not share in the benefit of seeing our risen Savior, he wants us with Thomas to confess, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Now, as we pass these elements around, if you don't believe the message, just, we just ask that you let it go past you. We don't want you to be confused because this is, this is simply a symbol of what we believe. It does not save you. But we do want you to know that we do not celebrate this table out of a blind faith. We celebrate it convinced that our Savior has come, that he lived the perfect life of righteousness that you and I can never live, that he died the death that we deserve to die, and that he rose again on the third day. We celebrate this table out of a faith that is sure and based on the testimony, the testimony of the word that has been handed down to us to tell us we serve a risen savior. The Messiah has come, his name is Jesus, and he has rescued you, not in the way that we even today, not being the Jews of the past, we would want a Messiah who'd get us on the right course and tell us what to do and to jump in and lift ourselves up from our own bootstraps and take it from there. The Messiah that came is Messiah that, that is Jesus and he came to accomplish all that we could never accomplish. He did it on our behalf. This is what we celebrate. And this, as John says, is written so that you may believe. So if you don't believe, Again, don't confuse yourself by taking these elements. But we want you to believe. The testimony is true. It is true. It is good. It is right. And it is the only way that sinful man can have peace with our creator. Let me pray. Father, I praise your name that you have purchased for us such a wonderful salvation. I thank you that we come to this communion table every Sunday because I need the reminder, Father, and even as John's letter is written to evangelize those who do not yet believe, uh, in the same tone, it strengthens those of us who do reminds us of our weakness, reminds us that we have a savior who is worthy of all praise, who is the lamb, the spotless lamb of God, who has come to take away our sin. And we get to celebrate in this table and confess along with Thomas. Thank you, my Lord and my God. Amen.